Hello everyone, today is Thursday, July 14th, 2016, and this is the week in charts. So what are we going to talk about? Well, I want to continue my discussion about Brexit and other so-called catastrophic news events, or catastrophic news events, I should say, as it relates to markets, and what you could do about them, what you have to do about them, and how in some cases you could actually use them to your advantage. Uh, we, do, we do have a major sell signal that has now been reset, so the next question is now what? And we'll take a look at that. Uh, the good news is technical analysis is alive, and well, I'm a man on the streets kind of guy, and this is going to this is a report on what happened last weekend, which makes me believe that technical analysis will continue to work. Of course, uh, any questions you have, just let me know. And then we'll take a look at your favorite stock picks. Uh, hold off on your stock picks until we get to the charts, until the actual charts, live charts. And that way uh, they won't get mixed in with the other questions. And also just ask about one stock at a time. You can ask about 20 stocks if you want. But just hit enter after each one so I can uh, talk about it and then delete it. Uh, this week's Week of Charts is brought to you by me once again and more specifically my trading service. So if you go to my website slash trading service, you can learn more about that. I also have a delayed version of the service, which is absolutely free. And that's a good way to get a feel for things both good, bad, and, and different. And I do have a, a getting started special where you can get started for just 47 bucks. Uh, it is a subscription. It does renew at the full rate, though. So just uh, just an FYI on that. All right, there's a disclaimer. Let me just sum it up real quick. All predictions about the future and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. If you want to actually read the disclaimer, it's on my website. Uh, they're kind of interesting. If you actually read them, there's a lot of things in there that say, uh, such as, uh, you know, close box before striking, um, if you smoke after sex, you're doing it too fast, things like that. Pretty interesting stuff. Uh, but most people don't read them. But it, it is on my website under about. Anyway, the good news is technical analysis is alive and well, and human nature never changes. Now, before we get into that, I just want to talk about one of my ground rules when it comes to technical analysis. It comes to trading in general, I should say. And if you look at my website, I think I've several times I've written columns which uh, outline the various ground rules. So I'll have to poke around my website and, and see if I can find them myself. But there is a search key. And I think if you search for ground rules, you should be able to find them. Anyway, uh, technical analysis leads the way or charts and only charts leads the way. And as far as I'm concerned, unless you're Bill Clinton, what is is now. The beauty of technical analysis is it's the only method out there where there is one hard and fast concrete rule, however you want to see it, look at it. With fundamental analysis, there is no rule that says like, okay, well, if the PE is a certain level, then you should buy a stock or sell a stock. There's nothing that has ever been proven from a fundamental standpoint that works from a concrete standpoint, or there's no concrete rule, I should say. Obviously, not everything works all the time, but as far as it comes to rules, there is one hard and fast rule. If a market is going to go from $5 to $10, I'm sorry, to $20, then it's going to have to pass through $10 along the way. So, if C is higher than A and B is somewhere in between, it will have to pass through B on its way to C. Now, can you just buy at B? Well, I have an IPO pattern that does something very similar to that. In fact, for lack of a better name, I called it buy at B. And my wife keeps telling me, why don't you put your name on something like John Bollinger? I'm like, ah, I keep forgetting. But you can't always just buy at B, but there are certain circumstances with IPOs that you could do just that. Also, just an FYI, not to digress too far, imagine that, but I've helped a couple of people win or certainly uh, place high in stock contests just simply by buying new highs. Now, you can't always blindly buy new highs, but I can tell you this, you'll do a lot better than trying to bottom fish like the gentleman I'm going to talk about in just a few minutes. So, 
technical analysis does lead the way. And by the way, it doesn't have to be that technical. For those of you who are newer or new to my methodology, you'll notice a lot of times I just draw arrows on a completely blank chart. And it's taken me a long, long time to come back to that beginning. I'm working on a on a beginner's course right now. And and I first began thinking, okay, what does the beginner need to know? And then it quickly became something much more than that. What would someone who is much more seasoned need to come back to that they may have lost sight of if they're fighting trends and things like that? So I believe in keeping it simple. And if I could go back in time, and this is kind of how I approached the course once I started really getting to the nitty gritty of writing it. But if I can go back in time and talk to that 20 something year old version of me, what would I what would I say? And I would actually give them the course and say, this is it. Just keep it really simple. Yeah, there's some uh, nuances here. There's some tips and tricks. And there's some things like stock selection you're going to have to learn and get good at. But for the most part, here it is. This is a trend. This is what you should do. Here's a simple money management plan. Just follow it, and your life's going to be a lot easier over the next 20 years, 20-something years. Add, don't bother chasing that holy grail. Anyway, I keep it simple, and I don't use any news, any fundamentals, or any other extraneous information. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about how you could actually use the news to your advantage in a few minutes. But for the most part, other than using it as a, as a possible tool, we don't actually factor those things in, into our trading. And your life will get a lot easier when you stop doing these things. As I often say, do not confuse the issue with facts. And I'm going to talk a lot about that in just a few seconds. Now, in a nutshell, my definition of trading with technical analysis or using charts is the use of charts to read the emotions of others while at the same time embracing our own. So as you can see, I, I showed a little uh, trading psychology there. It's not just the trading psychology of the other people. It's also your own psychology. So recognize what mistakes others may be making or where they might be looking to get out or if there is an actual trend, what's happening, and then figure out a way, such as like a TKO, figure out a way to get on that trend where the TKO, the sharp down move, may have created a predicament with these traders. So read the emotions of the others, obviously, while at the same time controlling your own. Now, this is a lead in to what happened over the weekend. A friend of mine sort of uh, somewhat randomly stopped by, and we got to talking over a beer about a stock that he had been buying. And I don't know why, but my friends never asked me before they buy a stock. And I think I think that's an egotistical thing. I think that that's their ego. I think what they want to do secretly, I'm just guessing now, freshman psychology, ruin its ugly head. But I think what they want to do is I think they want to buy a stock and make a lot of money and then tell me after the fact what they did. Family members are the same way. And, and that could end up uh, we, you could end up with some very heated arguments if you're if you're not ready for some tough love. Anyway, he explained to me that he really liked the company and that he knows the CEO personally, really likes the CEO. Well, I actually met this CEO, and he's a nice guy. He's the kind of guy that you would want to have a beer with and hang out with. He's a, he's a great guy. And he explained to me, uh, not the CEO, but my friend, explained to me that the company was ran very well and compared to other companies in the same industry, they really have their act together, whereas some of these other companies, they're just kind of uh, winging it, and they're in a lot of debt and all these other things. So he was really building a case for the company. And then he told me that he bought some since it seemed kind of low. And I think he also bought some just because he believed in the company. And then he bought some because it seemed low. And then he bought on the way down. And then he told me that when it got really cheap, he bought even more, thinking that he could flip it out at a higher level. Well, I don't want to digress too far, but I think that was in Market Wizards, one of those uh, market type of books, 
where they call like the more on trade. Okay, you put more on. It's the more on trade, not trend following more on trade, but putting more on a losing position. And that's not usually a good thing to do. Now, I said, okay, let's let's take a walk over to my office and let's take a look at the stock. And the first thing I did was I drew a big blue arrow on the screen. Now, first thing he said was, yeah, but that's in hindsight. And then I admitted, I said, well, to some extent, yes, but in his own words, he did buy on the way down, and he did buy because it was cheap, but he also did some other things, which would he actually do, it was headed lower. So he actually bought some, and it started going lower. So at that point in time, I realize hindsight's twenty twenty, but he had already made his first purchase when – it went down and he was losing money and he continued to buy more and more and more as a stock continued to drop. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Anybody remember George Carlin talked about, uh, in your own words, uh, when you're <laughs> people on a stand, <laughs> if you're, um, if you're in court, they all, they say, uh, in your own words, I think if you ever had to testify and they said, uh, in your own words, Mr. Landry, I think I would go, moon patata hota, ta 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 ha, you know? <laughs> anyway, I just get a kick out of that. Um, so before I digress too far and get too silly, you could see the stock is obviously headed lower, and then he bought it away down. So it was not in hindsight. And here's the thing, too. He bought originally back here somewhere. Well, it was obviously dropping like a stone at least shorter term. So you can't say that it was a complete hindsight because it was dropping and then he bought into it. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is that technical analysis is alive and well, and that human nature never changes. And I'm going to flesh that out in just a few seconds. And what you have to remember is, and this is, again, coming back to the basics, but sometimes people forget the basics. A company is not a stock, and I actually began showing him these slides uh, I don't think he was very interested in them, but I showed him anyway. But a company is not a stock. There are two completely different things. A stock represents ownership in a company, and a company is a profit-making concern or a concern that seeks profits. One is a physical entity, and one represents ownership in that entity. And then obviously a stock is not a company. They're two different things. A company may be doing great things and you may think it's going great places and the CEO might be a guy you want to hang out and drink beer with, but that in and of itself isn't reason to buy the company. Now, if you want to throw those things in and the chart looks fantastic, then by all means, use that to build your case, but don't make liking the company in and of itself the reason you want to buy. Now, here's the human nature when it comes to technical analysis. People tend to buy and trade the familiar. I just, as I was booting up my charts, I was looking at the chat that goes on there. I don't pay too much attention to it, but every now and then I'll take a look uh, just by accident. And they were talking about Apple. And it's like, well, why bother with Apple when it's going completely sideways? when you could sift through your database and maybe find a little gold stock that's taken off right now or these energy stocks that are waking up again. And with the market at all-time highs, maybe there's something else out there. But people tend to buy the familiar. So in this particular case, my friend uh, was in the same industry as his company was. So he was familiar with the industry, so he wanted to buy the familiar. Nine out of ten times, I don't know anything about a company I'm buying other than what sector they're in. And if you could get to the point where you become that technical analysis purist or chart purist and you're just buying things that go up, selling things that go down, and leaving things alone that go sideways, you might want to write that down. Your life is going to get a lot easier. But as soon as you start confusing the issue with facts, you'll end up with analysis paralysis. And if anything, not to digress too far into the fundamental deal, but if anything, 
a lack of fundamentals or poor fundamentals in momentum stocks actually makes for good trades. And, and I think I was interviewed by Charles Kirk many years ago, and I said, one day I'm going to build the system, and one of the inputs to the system is going to be that the stock must have poor fundamentals. And then as I was uh, answering the questions in the interview, I got to think, I was like, wait a minute, I think I've already done that. I think I already have. Uh, as an example, I'm trying to think of the name of the stock. I forget what it is. Maybe CLDX, I forget. Uh, it might have been an IPO we were along, but we had a pretty decent uh, run in an IPO, maybe 50% or more. And it was a good trade. And I was, I don't know why, but I, I punched it up. Oh, I was looking to see what sector it was, more specifically, like it was, was in like a subsect of biotech or whatever. And I happened to notice that they lost $3 a share in the stock, if memory serves, was around $15 or $16. So you got a $15, $16 stock and they're losing $3 a share. And I think that was at a quarter. I mean, that's how much the stock is losing. But again, don't confuse the issue with facts. If you did say, well, I can't buy that stock to lose money, then you would have missed a really good trade. We're here to trade, okay? And we're here to try to capture a trend and make money off of that trend. So don't confuse the issue with facts. It may be a great company, but wait to buy it until it starts going up. There's no need to buy it on the way down, okay? It's not on sale. Now, you could buy a stock at low levels, and you could treat it like an option that never expires, expires except for the fact that the big caveat is if that company goes bankrupt. If you could be assured that the company would never go bankrupt, which you can't because bad things happen to uh, many, bad, many good companies, unfortunately. But if you were assured that it would never go bankrupt, then you could hold on that stock forever, okay, and it never go to zero. Unfortunately, forever might be a long time to tie up capital. As I wrote in last week's column last Friday, there are no good longer-term investments. That does not mean that I will not hold a stock longer term. Sometimes I'll hold a stock two, maybe three years. My ideal holding period would be 10 years or more for every stock, but usually the money management takes me out much sooner than that. So people will, people are uh, not immune to human nature. They're going to buy the familiar. They're going to confuse the issue with facts. They're going to seek bargains. They're going to think that something is cheap. My problem with it, and if you're a, if you're a value player, my problem with value players is something might look cheap here, but then it just keeps on going down. So is it even better here? You know, at what point do you throw in the towel? And I don't want to pick on any value players, but if you look at some of the value players out there, look at their returns, they have drawdowns of 50% or more. Those who, who clients don't quit them, but there's one famous guy out there that occasionally loses over 50%. And, and that's fine, you know, but one has to wonder if it's always going to come back. And the other thing with human nature is, Obviously, people look to get out at break even. Now, that's just overhead supply because I remember him saying, yeah, I bought when it was bouncing around this range and then it dropped below it. And when it gets back up there, I'm going to bail out. Well, I've had several friends tell me they're going to do this. As I said before, a neighbor called me a few years ago and wanted to buy a stock and it was at 17. I said, uh, I said, I don't know. It's looks like 23 might be the cap on it because it looks like there's a lot of trading in there and people might look to get out of break even. And he's like, oh, I, I, I bought it at 23. So he thought he could A, buy a bargain to try to recoup some of his loss so he could flip it back out when it gets back to break even on his other shares. And maybe in the meantime, through bargain hunting, make a little money. So the point is that human nature does never changes and that technical analysis is alive and well. Now, that might not sound too exciting to you guys, but for me it is. It makes me feel good. It makes me feel like I'm doing the right thing here and then that my little man on the street is a microcosm of what's really out there, and I think it is. Now, let's talk about this Brexit next thing, okay? The market got its panties in a wad over this Brexit thing, and now, now what? Well, that's why 
I said, what me worry? And the, uh, along the lines of Alfred E. Newman a couple of weeks ago when this all went down. Now, the chart's a little dated, but you could see that, or you now know that we have exceeded the pre-Brexit vote. And the reason I left this chart in from last week was because I wanted to show you where the buy would be. Because remember, we talked about it. If you are going to trade a big picture news event, then let the news event unfold and then buy when it crosses back above the pre news event price as i've told the story a thousand times again people like the familiar so i'm sitting there in dallas or standing there in dallas and i'm showing these guys all all these great and girls charts that have trends and why you should trade trends and tr preach a trend trend trends and then, then you know somebody's like what's going to happen to apple because the ceo doesn't look like he's going to make it it's like ah, i don't know but wait until he croaks and then see what the price is the day before and buy the stock when it crosses back above it. And then, uh, unfortunately for Mr. Jobs, great gentleman, by the way, uh, he croaked not long afterwards. And what did the stock do? Well, it initially sold off, but then it took off for a while. Now, I'm not saying that you rush out and trade these big picture news events. But if you are going to trade the news, then I would recommend that you absolutely fade the news. Okay. So based on the Brexit buy, the Brexit news reversal buy, that would have triggered uh, right around 2,100 round numbers or so. Now, as I've been saying quite often, I left this in from last week, news is noise. And I wrote a column a while back, uh, market slips on Greece, G-R-E-E-C-E-L-O-L. And I just thought that was funny because this is, this is Greece down here, okay? And this little country, the size of, I think, West Virginia, which is somewhere in here, right, uh, is going to take down this entire country. But our market was initially selling off on that, and then it shrugged it off and then went on to something else. Now, keep in mind, there's always something to worry about, okay? So I just don't worry about anything. I try not to worry about anything. Do I still get pissed off? Yes. Am I interviewing myself? Yes. Okay, Do does the news sometimes go against me? Yes, but you have to deal with it. You have to handle it. So when it comes to news, if you're going to trade the news, then, then the best thing you could do would be to fade the news. You could maybe take an intraday as a G type of trade. So let's say that uh, they said, okay, Brexit's here, whatever, market drops, and then the market starts rallying up. It could be any news. So some sort of news event, let's say the market's here, okay, next day it opens down here, sells off a little bit more, but then begins to rally. Maybe go in, and this is, again, just for S&Gs, pick up a little day trade where your risk is fairly low because – Let's say you let it kind of base out a little bit. Let me draw it in a little better. But let's say the market's here and market opens down here. You wait a little while to see what happens. And if it bases out, begins to rally up, then you buy it and then you put it a stop down here and then maybe trail that stop all day. And then at the end of the day, get out. Okay, just a little day trade or flip it out during the day if you think you've got enough money, if you made enough money in a trade. So this risk here versus this potential reward can be pretty huge, okay? But again, this is not your bread and butter. This is an S&G trade. This wouldn't even be, I wouldn't even take a full position if you're doing something like this. But it's kind of a Jimmy Rogers, see the money in the corner, walk over, pick it up type of trade on these big news opening gap reversals. Now, again, on the bigger picture news reversal, you have an event, market sells off. When it takes out that event, pre-event closing high, then you look to get long, that pre-event close, I should say, okay? Now, I don't suggest you run out and do that, but it's good. It's a good tool to have in your toolbox, okay? Now, sometimes, and I think it was CLDX or one of these companies, and I didn't actually check the news, but it was pretty obvious it was probably bad news. Uh, it looked like this. Nice, nice trend. In fact, it was an accelerating trend. It's one of my favorite examples. I've used it quite often. 
but it was an accelerating trend. It was a persistent trend. It just had all the makings of a wonderful setup. And then bam, it had this sharp sell off. And I said to myself, self, that must be a news event. So sometimes news events can shape up very nicely into something like a TKO, earnings announcement, a failure of a drug, which I guess in this particular case was something like that. And then when this big sharp down move gets taken out, when the stock rallies back up, or if the stock rallies back up, this move has shaken out the weak hands and probably also attracted a lot of shorts. I don't know why, but shorts tend to be a little bit more egomaniacs. They like to short markets because they are high. They like to pick a top. I don't know why they like that, but that seems to be the general statement with shorts. They do interject a lot of fundamentals into the trade. Uh, and this particular stock was probably losing its butt. It probably came out with even worse earnings or a drug failure or whatever. Company's abysmal, but so what? It's going up. And it's it's hard to wrap your head around that early in the process. I think that if you go way, way back in time to when you first got started, you probably did not start. I don't think most people start with charts. Most people start with fundamentals because it makes so much sense. Let's find a good company. Let's buy some good companies. Okay. Now, the other thing you could do with news is you could apply a little damage control. Like I just said earlier, let's say that news event does go against you. Again, it's not to say that news does not affect the markets. Okay. It does. But there's nothing you could do about it. You can't predict the news. And even if you could, you can't predict the reaction to the news. So let's say you are along a little stock and you got to stop right around here and some sort of bad news comes out and the stock opens down here. Well, the bomb's already blown up. Okay. So what you could do. And this is obviously you have to pull your stop at these news events. And this, this is provided that you're disciplined enough to apply a little discretion. What you could do is I often preach is wait to see if it finds its low fairly quickly and then begins a rally and then try to mitigate those losses. Either maybe a trailing stop intraday or if it, or if it gets well above your prior stop in here, put that stop back in. And then sometimes you could actually stay with the position longer term. Now, sometimes it won't, okay? Now, even though the market often comes right back after a news event, it won't always come back. So you can't always assume it's going to come back and that the market will be illogical both in its overreaction and then come right back. So, again, at some point, you might have to honor that stop or get out. And as I preach, he who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. Dave, how about a shout out on the first new high in over a year? Yeah, absolutely. We're going to talk quite a bit about that. Getting ahead of me. Stop reading ahead. Okay. Now, as I've said quite often, market timing is tough. Okay. I would much rather pick an individual stick uh, stock. Uh, I was trying to say ticker, uh, individual stock. And that's why I go through a couple thousand stocks every night trying to find that next big opportunity. Inefficiencies are going to occur a lot more in an individual stock than the overall market. In fact, in the overall market, you're really not going to have any really big inefficiencies. And the reason you're not going to have that, by the way, inefficiency means things aren't priced in, okay? A 150% move in a little biotech stock or a little energy company that we're long right now went up 90% last time I checked. That move wasn't priced into the stock, okay? That stock is, is, is nearly doubled from where it was. So that wasn't priced in. So that's an inefficient type of move. And by the way, when I, when I meet traders who are talking in terms of efficient versus inefficiencies that's that along with like money management when i hear traders talking about these things it makes me realize that these guys really know what they're doing so i think that's a very important concept to wrap your head around if you haven't already done so but a market 
like the index futures, for instance, or the index overall, is very efficient because you have hedgers and you have investors. And as I wrote in a column, I think last week, uh, jokers, midnight tokers, you know, lovers, fighters, uh, one lotters, hedgers. I don't know if I said that already. A lot of derivative players and all these players tend to cancel each other out. It gets pretty choppy. Back when I did a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of mechanical testing, especially in commodities, early in my commodity trading advisor days, every time I'd throw an S&P system up, I just could not make it work. And I was kind of baffled for a while. And then there was one uh, guy out there doing systems or whatever, and he just said, oh, you just buy the S&Ps and forget about them. Well, that, that works as long as the market is going up, but the market, as you know, doesn't always go up. But that's that's another story. But very hard to implement a trend-following system in something like index futures. So market timing is tough. And as I said a second ago, the market doesn't always go up longer term. Obviously, 2000, we had a 50% drop. And in 2008, well, 2000, 40%, 75% for the NASDAQ. 2008, both the NASDAQ and the S&P 500 lost over half of their value. So it's fine as long as you don't have to retire in a year where the market loses half of its value. And again, the mini players tend to cancel each other out. Now, even though market timing is tough, you still need a general framework to work around. And as I've been saying at nauseam since last summer, we had a major sell signal in the S&P 500. And major being, in this particular case, was a bow tie coming off of all-time highs. So at all-time highs, everybody who's ever bought the market and is still long is happy. But when that market begins to sell off, they begin to question their investments. Okay. So this actually triggered last fall. And then the market made a retrace back up, sold off fairly hard. So there was a pretty decent move out of the system provided that you could have held on. I'm not saying, again, that you rush out and trade this in and of itself, but it does help to give you a general framework. So we had this major sell signal last summer, and the market had a little throwback, but then had a pretty decent sell off from it, okay? And then we had a minor buy that triggered recently. Now, minor because it's not coming off of major, major lows, like 10-year lows or 15-year lows, or what was the S&P in 2009? It was like 13-year lows, okay? So this is a minor signal, again, because it's not coming off of major lows, but it's a signal nonetheless. And then the major signal gets reset from this major signal when this high is taken out. Now, I'm not suggesting you rush out and do this, but maybe if you are dabbling in a more efficient market like Forex, maybe look at like an hourly chart and when the market makes multi-year highs, maybe look for like uh, um, something like a bow tie on an hourly chart and then put in a stop back above that high or look for a major low and then look for an hourly buy and then put in a stop below that low and trade those more major signals in those more efficient markets. But before I digress too far, so we, we're now on a reset on that signal. So this signal is done, okay? For what it's worth, it's done. Now, as I said earlier, you need to have a general framework to work around. So there's nothing wrong. I got criticized for, for what people thought was me being bearish. No, it wasn't bearish, but I said, hey, we got a sell signal. So let's not rush out and buy stocks willy-nilly. We did buy quite a few stocks since last summer but it was done on a very methodical and selective basis because we knew we didn't have that rising tide, or at least it wasn't obvious that we had that rising tide of the overall markets. The old market adage, a rising tide lifts all boats. One of the few adages that's, that's pretty much true because the market going up in general will really help give you a little tailwind, not the mixed metaphors. So we have a signal reset. Now the question is, is this the all clear? Well, it's a little dangerous at this juncture to just jump in, but it certainly is an improvement, okay? I have to admit it's getting better, but you know me. Let's not start kissing each other just yet unless it starts looking like something like 1999. Now, one thing that scares me a little bit is um, 
Austin, Austin Powers. There's only two things that scares me. You know, cornies, uh, little hands, smell like cabbage. So other than cornies, um, one thing that scares me is V-shaped recoveries. They can be dangerous, but what is is, as Howard pointed out, hey, we're at new highs. And as a trend follower, yeah, we're at new highs. That's a good thing, okay? But these V-shaped recoveries at high levels can be kind of scary because by the time the market gets all the way back to new highs, it's already overbought, and it's very hard to put a new leg on top of an old leg. But stranger things have happened, okay? Now, we did have a long one-year-plus consolidation where the market was all over the place, and now we're breaking out to new highs again. By the way, I'm just kind of noticing this, and this is why I love teaching because I notice things on the fly. I'm wondering if we'll end up with, like, the mother of all broadening formations in here. Broadening formations are kind of fun to talk about, but they're difficult to trade. Eventually, they usually end badly. I don't want to. I don't want to digress too far into that. I don't use all of classical technical analysis. Sometimes something like a broadening formation I find interesting, but I really don't think you can trade off of it. Anyway, before I digress too far, we get the V-shaped recovery in the indices, and then in the Rusty and the NASDAQ, we'd still have some overhead supply to deal with. Now, remember I said earlier about my friend who's looking to get out of break even when he gets back to the price he bought in the range. Well, that's the same thing, but on a macro level, that could happen in the NASDAQ because we still have quite a bit of trading right above where we are. And also, we're a little overbought. So as I've been saying quite a bit to people in the service, um, Buying an overbought market as it's bumping into overhead supply is a dangerous thing. Now, somebody pulled me aside after a webinar, a seminar once. It's like, uh, every time there's overhead supply, I find the market just keeps on going and it goes through it. It's like, well, not every time. But again, you have to have a framework to work around. It's going to have a hard time. It's much easier for it to make new highs when it's up at clear air than when you have overhead supply. So unfortunately, not all technical analysis works all the time, but you have to have, again, not to beat the dead horse, you have to have that general framework you're going to work with, work around. In this particular case, it's hard for me to buy a market blindly or as a general statement when it's A, overbought and right around overhead supply. Now, obviously, the Russell 2000 has been the poster child for – overhead supply and you can see it's been trading sideways for a long long time but so far now this is a weekly chart so much um, much bigger picture we'll take a look at the daily here when we get to the uh, to the live charts but it is overbought even somewhat longer term and it is pushing into this overhead supply so far like butter so so far pretty impressive move but it still has its work cut out for it. Also, notice this is 2013, so we still haven't made much forward progress since 2013. So that's the other thing to consider. Never forget, as I preach ad nauseum, about the net-net change. So again, I think it's getting better. But there's a couple of observations. One, the first time in a long time... My phone began to ring uh, when I'm at cocktail parties and just bumping into people, man on the street type of thing. When they find out what I do, it's like they're, 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 the man on the street's been a little skittish. Seems like the man on the street is usually always somewhat bullish. But this last little Brexit thing kind of woke everybody up. So I think that if we begin to come back in, People are like, oh, no, here we go again. Now, you can't time a market off of that. That's just kind of my gut feel off of the uh, observation. And like I said, overbought is, is hard to sustain. It's hard to build a leg on top of another leg. We can insert whatever metaphor you want. Uh, in chart terms, it's like the market's here. It's hard for that market to build another leg, at least – not without some serious corrections. Uh, unfortunately, if you have serious corrections now, then you're looking at potential uh, back-to-back signals, which I'll mention in just one second. 
And it's, it's also hard to run a race right after you have ran a race. Now, some sectors are kind of questionable. Bonds are in nosebleed territory. We'll take a look at those in a few minutes. But here's the deal. There's always something to worry about. And quite often, the market can climb the wall of worry. Now, the other thing to consider, as I said a few minutes ago, let's say that man on the street feels good right now because he's back to do highs or he's back to break even. And he's thinking, OK, well, maybe this investing thing is going to work out after all. And then the market begins to correct from this overbought or begins to slide a little bit. And God forbid some other bad news might flow into the market. Then I think he might be a little bit more skittish. He might be a little bit more worn down because he's like, oh, I should have learned my lesson. And again, human nature never changes. So that could set up a potential second mouse type of signal. We talked about second mouse last week. The early bird gets the worm, but it's the second mouse that gets the cheese. Sometimes those second signals, especially on a major standpoint, are the true signals. And it's hard when you're trading, but let's say you're trading a bow tie and you're looking at a major low in the market and you get stopped out and then it goes back and makes a double bottom. And then you get another bow tie. Sometimes it's hard to go back after something after you just got burnt. You know, you know, you don't step and poo and turn around and step right back in it, right? <laughs> What's the old saying about getting divorced and then getting remarried to the person you divorced? But sometimes doing the hard thing is the thing to do. That second signal becomes the true signal. As I said, I think last week I, I knew a trader. I don't. Um, I guess he's still around, but in his office he would only hire. I'm sorry, he would only let the new, the, when he would hire a new trader, that's easy for me to say, uh, when he hired a new trader, he would only let that trader trade second signals until he got his feet wet and gained some confidence. Those signals are going to be much more accurate. Unfortunately, you're going to have to let a lot, a lot of markets go by without you, okay? So I'd rather take the first signal and then be willing to take a sec, second signal too. Got to be in the water for the tide to lift it. Well, why don't you wait for the tide to move and then get in the water? You know, it's like fishing. <laughs> you don't want to fish when the tide's not moving. So, again, what is is, okay? Uh, keep in mind that you're never going to look smart or you're uh, – uh, let me rephrase that. Let me just read the slide. You won't always look smart as a trend trader. OK. And also, sometimes you might be a little late to the game because you are a trend follower. You have to first have a trend before you can follow it. And sometimes you just have to be a trend following moron. So as Howard pointed out earlier, how about a shout out for the market making new highs? It's like, well. Yeah, I have to admit it's getting better. If this market keeps making new highs. And it, by the way, what have I said? What have I said repeatedly since last summer? Hey, guys, we got a sell signal. But it's fine with me if the market goes straight back up and makes new highs. Much easier to trade a market on the upside longer term than it is to short a market. So here we are at new highs. Let's see if we follow through. Let's see if the NASDAQ can follow through. A couple announcements, and then we'll uh, hop into the charts. I'm still uh, rolling out the website. I think it's pretty much done. Uh, if you guys find any errors, or busted links, or, or anything you like or don't like, let me know. Um, I welcome feedback and comments. And I am putting some older comment, uh, some old commentary videos and stuff uh, on the back end. And then I'm also putting a lot of stuff on um, out on YouTube, too. So a uh, combination of those two things. And it's older content. Uh, but good stuff. I'm finding a lot of... Uh, money management, psychology, and then obviously methodology type of, of weekend charts. And I'm getting those up slowly but surely, maybe uh, sometimes one a day, sometimes a little bit less. And then I'm still working on a beginner's course, as I've been saying. And, and then what I found, again, is I'm, I, it's, it's, at first I thought, man, this is going to be boring working on this beginner's course. And I've actually been having a blast doing it. It's been a lot of fun. It's been interfering with some of the other work I have going on because I, I want to work on it. And it's like, what can I go back in time? If I could go back in time, what would I tell that, that young version of me? 
about the markets. And it's not some secret sauce. Like I said earlier, it's like, hey, there is no secret. Just follow the trend. Don't try to outsmart things. You're going to need a little money management. And guess what? The fight is often within, like the old Pogo comment, comic. We have met the enemy and he is us. And I will be rolling out um, some of that free. Quite a bit of that will be rolled out free, which will really build the base for um, technical analysis. So even if you're a more seasoned trader, in fact, I addressed that in one, in one of the first slides, I'd recommend, especially if you hit, hit, hit the in, inevitable rough patch, easy for me to say, to go back to the basics. And I talk a lot about the importance of going back to the basics. So I'm writing it for the true beginner and I'm also writing it for the more experienced trader who may have lost sight of the basics. Now I know the more experienced trader probably won't go back and watch it, but that's exactly what they should do. And I think with that mentality in mind, it's making for a much, a much better course. How about a label, lapel pen, label, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> How about a lapel pen that says trend folly more in any store? I'd buy one, John Dearborn. Uh, hey, John. Uh, actually, at, at one point, uh, I don't know if Cafe Press is still in existence, but at one point I was selling them through Cafe Press. Uh, but I think they, I think they shut down, or they shut down the small guys. But yeah, I should probably have some aid to just give them out. I do have the ultimate guide to, what is it? The ultimate guide to market trends, and it's three pages. It's an uptrend, a downtrend, and a sideways arrow. I've got a thousand. I had like a thousand of them printed in China. I've got to start mailing those out, or it's they've been sitting in my office collecting dust for years. Um. Usually when I speak somewhere, I'll pull, a, I'll bring a few and, and hand them out. Anyway, let's take a look at the overall market, and then let's work our way into uh, some sectors and then uh, individual stocks. You guys want to start asking about individual stocks? Feel free to do so now. All right, first, uh, let's take a look at the P's. Let's see what's happening uh, now and what's been happening. Oops, here we go. Uh, today, obviously, decent day. This market is, if you want to call it, climbing the wall of worry. Certainly do on that. Uh, this is the pre-Brexit vote. And then remember what I said earlier, you could it's it's um, it's not my cup of tea because I don't think you'll you'll make enough longer term. But it does test out if you're playing these new news reversals Buy when it crosses back above the pre-news day. But you can see so far that's worked out pretty nicely. Let's take a look at the weekly chart. Uh, weekly chart you can see up here at all time highs. Certainly a good thing. Not going to argue with that. Uh, as usual, we want to see follow through, but one day at a time. Now, keep in mind that when you break out, you need to clear the prior range decisively before you correct. So that's what I was saying earlier. If we begin to correct it here, and I don't think it'll let me draw it in, but if we begin to correct it here, it's going to have the look, uh, still have a look of multiple tops. So as usual, follow through is key. It seems like I spent a lot of time talking about waiting for follow through okay yeah keep the keep the stock picks coming we'll get to them in just one minute uh again nasdaq uh overhead supply to deal with uh, not a bad day so far but it does look like it's running out of little steam in here as it's plowing into this remaining overhead supply and same thing going on with the russell 2000 again uh decent day so far uh, you know better than the pokemon i guess uh, but off its best levels, a little bit of an opening lap reversal. And you can see same thing happened yesterday, opening lap reversal. So it is running out a little steam in here. And unfortunately, it's never good when the market loses steam right at overhead supply, okay, or even at all-time highs like the S&P. So I hate to use the word hope, but hopefully we'll see some follow-through. Just want to point out a couple sectors in here, and then we'll uh, get to your stock picks. Uh, drugs stalled out pretty badly yesterday at the top of their range. So all isn't uh, hunky-dory in the markets. Also, certain sectors like software, for instance, I noticed were kind of uh, kind of at nosebleed levels with these V-shaped recoveries. Might be running out of a little bit of steam in here. So that's going to be hard for me to rush out and buy a stock that looks like that. Uh, I still like the energies. Uh, I like the little breakout they had. I like the fact that they're still in an uptrend from lows. Keep in mind with the energy is because they're based on a commodity or they're heavily influenced by a commodity, they're going to be fairly 
uh, e, I'm not going to say efficient because they can make inefficient moves, the energy stocks that is, but they can be quite choppy in those inefficient moves. For instance, C and X is one more long. Um, and notice that we got long back here and it has a bit of straight route higher, but it's been a pretty good run um, if I say so myself. So what's that? Uh, 117%. We didn't get quite all of that, but and where is it today? 116%. So you can see very inefficient move, okay, but kind of choppy along the way. But at least it's made an inefficient move. Um, metals and mining. Let's take a look at those guys. Still bullish in those guys. It's been led mostly by gold. But if you take a look at some of the other areas like steel and iron, uh, they're beginning to catch up and kick it into gear. So it's becoming a much more broad-based rally, rally once again. Uh, again, like other commodity-related areas, not a straight line higher, but certainly making a decent move higher nonetheless. So I think we could probably see some uh, more setups here soon. We're looking after it. We're looking out, uh, looking at a gold now. Andre just asked me about 15 gold stocks. In fact, we'll jump in those in just, just one minute. I think that's it. Uh, real estate continues to bang out new highs. We'll take a look at um, bonds. Hard for me to get too excited about real estate. Uh, HV really low on the sector. And um, not that I would never buy a market because it's too high, but one has to wonder how much further it has to go, especially since it's lower in volatility. So I'm kind of factoring all that in. It's like, okay, well, I've got to buy a, sto a stock or stocks that are lower in volatility and something bad could still happen. Uh, I'd almost rather buy a more volatile stock knowing the nature of the beast. As I often say, better the devil you know. And if you Google that, I've got a pretty good article on that, if I say so myself. It was written originally written in Traders Magazine, but it is on my website. Bonds beginning to correct a little bit. They've been at kind of nosebleed levels. Again, you know, you could follow a trend forever, but one has to wonder how much further rates have to go. Eventually, uh, I guess they can go negative, like somebody said last week, but that would be not a good thing. Well, that would not be a good thing, obviously. So bonds, for the most part, still doing pretty good. Rates pretty low historically. Okay. Uh, Jim, that's a setup. That's a stock that we're watching in the, in the trading service, so I can't comment on that. But, um, yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's setting up, absolutely. Not quite there yet. Okay, Andre wants to talk about the dollar, and then he wants to talk about a lot of goals, and we'll get to all of those. We should have plenty of time. Dollar's kind of bottomed out in here. Let's throw some moving averages in, see what happens. Um, let's back the chart out a little bit. It looks like it's still under a major sell signal. Remember we talked uh, ad nauseum about those bow ties. So you still have a major sell signal on a weekly chart on the dollar. But on shorter term, you obviously have some shorter term buy signals in here. And let's back the chart out a little bit. But I wouldn't rush out and buy the dollar at this juncture. So longer term, I still think it's in trouble. Uh, shorter term, obviously, it's headed higher. But I wouldn't, I would not try to make any predictions on the dollar. Big picture predictions with something like the dollar can be really tough. Let's just take a look at an hourly chart for S&Gs. Um, so if you are going to trade something like a currency, maybe you look at an hourly chart or whatever, and you can see hourly chart right here, dollar looks like it's topping out. So that could be a, um, an S&G type of trade. But longer term, I really don't have a, a good prediction for you with the dollar, other than it might still be in trouble longer term. Steve says, nice webinar. Thank you, Steve. Good to see you. Uh, GMO. Yeah, this looks pretty good. Uh, nice longer-term uptrend in here. Uh, the only problem is if it pulls back, it needs to pull back a little bit. If it pulls back too much, it would be back into this prior little high or this little breakout. So for me to get excited about it, I'd like to see it break out a little bit more, maybe to 40-something dollars a share and then have that pullback in here. But uh, certainly can't argue with that as a market that's in a trend. And then we're right around these all-time highs. So, yeah, certainly uh, worth putting on your radar. And you've got pretty decent volatility on that. That's not bad for uh, your HV. 
So absolutely keep that on your radar. Arsene wants to know about YRD. YRD. Um, this is a good stock to put on your momentum list. And this, we got a little bad tick in here, so it's hard to figure it out. But let's see what's going on. Uh, the problem is if it begins to pull back, it's going to pull back to this prior peak, kind of like the one we just looked at or the one we looked at a few back. And then, um, so, so excuse me, what I would like to do or what I would what I would do is keep it on your radar, but wait to see if it could pull back. I'm mean, sorry, wait to see if it could take off maybe to the mid-20s or at least $20-something a share and then look to play pullbacks along the way. So, again, let it clear that prior peak before going after it. John wants to know about USLV that's going to be silver, I think. Yeah, it's three times. These are three times shares, so just don't trade these things unless you are going to do something like a crazy-ass day trade or something, okay? Um, very dangerous to trade triple leverage things. Um, tracking errors are absolutely abysmal anytime you increase the leverage. And if you're trading short to intermediate term, and even if you're trading much shorter term, such as intraday trading, uh, you're still you're still dealing with the the leverage that it all washes out because this at three times leverage is going to be three times greater in volatility than the one times leverage or no leverage. So you're going to have to use a stop that's three times as greater as great. So now you just washed out your leverage and you're dealing with the tracking error on top of that. So yeah, they could make some substantial moves and it's like candy, you know, they look good and, and it's kind of exciting, but uh, avoid them like the plague. So maybe just look at, you know, you want to play silver SLV, which is unleveraged, right? That would be the way to play it. Okay. If you're going to play those leverage ones, then maybe, again, crazy-ass day trades, which I would recommend you not do. But if you are going to do them, maybe do hourly bow ties or something like that and try to hold in for most of the day. Okay, John got it. He says, all right, enough, Dave. <laughs> he actually said good explanation. All right, uh, Francesco would like to look at American Waterworks, AWK. Uh, seemed to be a stable uptrend, but is it topping now? Well, so far, it's just kind of pulling back. Uh, it is a – it looks okay, all right? Uh, I can't argue with this setup. If you wanted to trade this setup, I wouldn't say it's topping just yet, okay? Although bonds, again, bonds are kind of at nosebleed levels. One has to wonder how much further they have to go. So if I was just seeing this setup and wasn't really paying attention to the scaling over here or the volatility, I would say, yeah, that's a good-looking setup. But if you look at the volatility, volatility pretty low at 16. Where's the spiders right now? Anybody know? I'll, I'll just look at 15, okay? So it's right in line with the overall market. As a general statement, you're not going to beat the overall market with stocks that are less volatile than the overall market, okay? That's where that inefficiency, efficiency thing comes into play. So this looks okay, but my problem is – because of the lower volatility, in order to make money on this trade, if you're, let's say you're applying a 2% rule with your money management, your stops wouldn't be that big. Well, that sounds like a good thing, right? Well, not really, because you would have to trade at a very large size to get the volatility right, to try to capture a decent move. And then uh, if you have time, go back and, and watch. I've got two videos on YouTube just on volatility and share size. So just know that if it's lower in volatility, your share size has to be much bigger. So, I mean, something like this, let's say you're using a three-point stop, okay, which is plausible, I would say, just eyeballing it, and you got a 100K account, so and you're trading 2% of that, so that's $2,000 divided by three equals – so you'd buy 666 shares. Let's just round it down to 600 shares. 600 times, let's say, 80 bucks a share. So you're looking at $48,000 of a 100K account would be put into this one stock. So roughly half of your account would be in one stock, and that's just way too dangerous. I'd much rather be in a crazy-ass 
a uh, little stock like CNX, where we're trading a, a much smaller percentage of our account is going into it. So something bad could always happen. I mean, we could American Waterworks. I don't know exactly what they do. Imagine it's something to do with water. They might find, um, God forbid, something bad in that water. Okay, or some something really bad could happen. This stock could half overnight. Okay. Sure, that could happen at a volatile stock, but if you're trading at a much smaller share size and if the normal noise alone allows you to take partial profits out, then you're going to have a much smaller position and you could survive even a 50% loss in a stock like that, okay? Again, go in and watch those two videos. It took me two hours to explain before, so uh, check that out. CUDA as a bow tie. See you do. Hey, Jim, how you doing? Uh, no, uh, bow ties, this would be, uh, yeah, minor bow tie, and it's what I call a forced bow tie, when a market makes a quick move higher. Bow ties are designed to catch more gradual changes in trends, so we want a bow tie. Now, we have other patterns for more abrupt changes in trend, but for the bow tie, what we're looking for, obviously, we're looking for the three moving averages to come together. But we want the moving averages, or we want the stock to just come down and bottom out and then begin to take off. Now, you're, if you're just kind of eyeballing a stock, especially at tops, I find, if you're just kind of eyeballing a stock at tops, you might not notice that they're beginning to roll over or it's beginning to roll over. But when you put the bow tie moving averages in there, you'll say, ah, it's beginning to roll over. The bow tie is not designed for a move that looks something like this where it just has this huge quantum leap higher. The bow tie is designed, or its intention, designer's intent, is to alert you to the fact that maybe a market is gradually rolling over, or maybe a market is gradually beginning to turn up, okay? So let's get back to that chart. So this big abrupt change, it wouldn't be a bow tie. And even if it was a bow tie, it's not coming off of uh, well, it's coming off of fairly major lows, but it's not like it's coming off lows back here. The other problem that I see with this stock is it trades in big chunks, okay? Maybe every time it has earnings, it loses a, a third of its value or something. So I would avoid this stock in general just because of the way it trades. And and no, I wouldn't consider that a bow tie. Uh, look for bow ties. Let's, let's go back to that CNX. Let's beat that one up today. Uh, look for bow ties like this where a stock is beginning to carve out a longer term bottom. You can see, draw, draw a trend line on here. Just draw your arrows, okay? Pretty abysmal trading for, for years in this stock. But then look what happens. It gets kind of sold out. You get a nice little bow tie back here. That trend may be turning. It's worth a shot, okay? And so far, knock on wood, it's moved nicely higher. So look for bow ties off of major, major lows, okay? And then avoid stocks with big gaps. At these levels, doesn't Vixy look like a sure thing, gamble, quick in and out trade? Well, unless you fully understand these, these VIX ETFs, and if you want to understand them, I would recommend someone like Larry McMillan. Um, be careful. I don't watch CNBC, but Larry has pointed out to me that sometimes there are people that will get on CNBC that will say things are just flat out wrong about these derivative products. You're looking at a derivative of derivatives of derivatives, okay? So you're going to have to make darn sure you fully understand what you're trading. I would avoid them. I wouldn't touch them with a 10-foot pole, okay? Uh, if anything, let's see something here. It looks like looks like this one just goes down. So if you could, if you could do something with it, short it. But obviously that'd be pretty dangerous. And they probably reverse split this thing. Uh, the reason it it tends to go down longer term is because it it works off the decay of the futures. Okay, kind of not enough time to get into that, but future the future value of something is greater than the present value. So there is a, a constant decay, and that works for uh, – usually that happens in commodities unless there's some weird situations. I think the word is – is the word contango? I forget. There's a, a, a reason sometimes it, it inverts. But as a general statement, this is a derivative product. I would avoid it like the plague, okay? 
it's a derivative of a derivative, maybe even of a derivative. So that's a long-winded way to say stay away from that. Oh, you're welcome, Jim. Jim says, thanks for the bow tie. Lesson, Andre waiting patiently in GD. That's going to be a goal stock. Last time I checked. Yeah, new goal. Um, I'd like to see it take out these prior highs decisively and then look to play the pullback, okay? And back to chart out a little bit. You can see nice little trend from lows. Again, with the bow ties, look for bow ties off of major, major lows, okay? Pan W was a star. Re-enter here, Pan W. That sounds like another goal, doesn't it? No, that's a, a Palo Alto Networks or something. No, no, no. Draw your draw your arrows, okay? It's headed lower. Uh, it's banging out. Oh, it's right towards multi-year lows. Um, no, I wouldn't go after this one. I mean, I, I hear you if it makes like a big picture double bottom, maybe a bow tie in here. But again, for me to buy bow ties, I'd much rather trade a bow tie down here at these all-time lows or multi-year lows, okay, uh, than to try to pick them up here. I mean, I guess it is multi-year lows, but I don't know. I think that you could probably find something better out there. Okay, AXU, AXU. Uh, let's zoom in a little bit. Yeah, uh, it's going to have to keep making new highs, obviously, and then uh, pull back. So, yeah, uh, all these goals should be on your watch list. But what I've been doing daily is, um, or with the metals overall, I should say, is I've just been going through the entire sector daily. Uh, Goro, I'm going to agree with you on that one, too. That's that's a good one uh, on a pullback, okay? But it looks fantastic. Now, here's one that's actually making new highs. This one needs to be on your watch list. It is on my watch list. I know that for a fact. Um, well, I don't need to show you. Just take my word. And again, I'm going through the sector each night. But nice, uh, nice trend here, and then nice accelerated trend. Look for a knockout move or something. I'm I'm waiting for these goals to knock out. Hello, Martha. WBA. Um, no problem with this stock is you could draw. It looks like I drew it in last week or week before. You could draw a sideways arrow, and it really hasn't done. Uh, it really hasn't done anything in a long time. Okay. Uh, you know, take a look at like the Goro, okay? What, draw your arrow on this stock. What does that look like, okay? Well, it looks like this, somewhat shorter term. And then if you back the chart way out, your arrow looks like this, okay? So it looks like it's working its way higher. It has a little supply back here, but for the most part, it looks pretty good. Whereas this WAG, or what was it? WBA, sorry. WBA is mostly sideways. Where is it now? 82, or I'm sorry, 84. Where was it back in 2015, 84? Okay, or 84-ish. So it hasn't made a whole lot of forward progress. I know we're kind of having fun with statistics here, but it hasn't made a whole lot of forward progress since 2015, or hasn't made any forward progress, I should say. Andre is all over the goals. GSS is going to be another goal, GSS. We should probably just go through the whole sector. Uh, yeah, it's kind of a penny stock, obviously, below a buck a share. But certainly, I can't argue it from a technical analysis standpoint. Major, major bottom in here. Has a little bad memories way back here, but I think that's far enough in the past to not get too excited about it, especially given the speculative nature of this stock, given the volatility is, is fairly high on this stock. So, yeah, by all means, but same as it is on all the other ones, or most of the other ones that will have to keep breaking out, except for Goro so far, and then look to play the pullback. So absolutely. CECO, C-E-C-O. Um, I'm not a huge fan of these educational stocks. And I don't do much testing anymore, but I did a few years back fire up a, fire up my programming or, or try to remember how to program a computer. And I did a bunch of testing on a bunch of different sectors. And I found that the educational stocks and shipping stocks were two huge standouts that usually universally lost money when you tried to trend follow. Now, it doesn't mean that you might occasionally see a good setup in these stocks, but the odds are generally stacked against you. And you can see that they do; it does chop around quite a bit. But... 
what is is, and so far it's kind of broken out. So maybe on a pullback, but I'm just not a huge fan of the educational stocks. But you can see it kind of looks a, light, a little bit like a ledger cardiogram longer term. It looks okay shorter term, though. I hear you. So, yeah, not bad, but I think you could find better. Sand, that sounds like another one of those metals and mining stocks. Uh, this one I can see does have some memories, bad memories that would be concerning enough. I know you're probably thinking that's somewhat arbitrary. But in this particular case, that's quite a bit of trading. Although it was well over a year ago, maybe even two years, so it's not horrible. But I think in the golds, like that Goro uh, might be a better bet. Uh, but in this case, see if it could break out to brand new highs decisively and then look to play the pullback. Same sort of deal. Ring, R-I-N-G, R-I-N-G, N-G. Yeah, that's not bad. Uh, again, gold miner, so it's no big uh, shocker. Let's see what the juniors are doing. Um, yeah, on a pullback, absolutely. Let's see what the juniors are up to, G, D, X, J. Uh, along the lines of ring, keep an eye on the juniors. Uh, on a pullback, the juniors might be worth a shot. And that would give you – look at the volatility in these juniors. It's 61, and that might get you that, – That's pro there's probably some penny stocks in here that you would get a ride off of if they took off. So – Keep this GDXJ on your momentum list. And what jumps out at me here is notice you've got this nice, somewhat gradual trend here, and then it's beginning to accelerate higher. So it's like one, two, and then the three would be the trend knockout move or some sort of pullback. So absolutely keep that on your list. Harmony Gold, somebody's a gold bug. Probably cannot argue with that. Uh, it has broken out to new highs, but it's going to have to keep breaking out, clear these highs a little bit more decisively. Are we seeing a pattern here? Or as my youngest daughter should say, a pattern. So we're seeing a pattern in these things where you want to see them just keep breaking out, make it to new highs decisively, and then pull back. If you're already long, stay long, though. It looks like a wonderful Darvis type of stock. BVN is going to be yet another. Gold Bivenudos, Bivenu, what is it? Uh, nope. Uh, Copana de Minas Buena. That's, uh, is that Portugal? Portuguese? Is that Brazil? Uh, not bad. It's in a decent trend on a pullback. Ideally, I like to see a little bit more acceleration, maybe a little bit more separation from this prior little peak in here. But certainly not bad and certainly worth keeping on your list. Peru. It's Peru, okay? Okay, gotcha. What's the language of Peru? I'm I'm so stupid sometimes. Is it Port Portuguese in Peru, or is it uh, what is it? Peruvian maybe, huh? <laughs> Anybody know what they speak in in Peru? A uh, little overhead supply to deal with here. Uh, big thick company but certainly in the right sector. So for me to get excited about X, Ken, it would have to break out the new highs and then pull back. KLDX for Mr. Howard, KLDX. Uh, not bad. It's a another metals and mining, okay. Uh, not bad on a pullback though, needs to pull back. I mean, that's a problem. A lot of these metals and mining need to pull back. Obviously, you don't want to pull it all the way back to the prior basin here, but certainly not bad. Good eye on that one for sure. XME, yeah, I'm going to agree with XME, Andre, because uh, it's metals and mining, right? Uh, oh, mate, major market index. I'm thinking, of, did you meant XMI? What am I thinking of for the metals? Uh, this is at all-time highs, but uh, that's not what you were asking about, was it? Or is it XME? Yeah, X and means the metals. Okay. Um, yeah, it's breaking out to marginal new highs and multi-year highs. So, yeah, on a pullback. Really, it's almost going to be throw a dart with these goals, but I do think that you could, um, I do think that you could find uh, some better ones. Spanish in Peru? Yeah, my, I, my South America trips have never materialized. I, that's, I haven't been to South America yet, so I'm kind of ignorant of um, – <laughs> what's down there. It's, I kind of learn about places by actually going there, you know, 
Uh, but I'd love to, I'd love to go to South America and, and, uh, it's, uh, I need, I need another continent on my, uh, on my little map. I bought a, I got a big map on my on the office wall and I put a little pin in it, uh, every time I go somewhere, but it was, it was kind of, I had to go to like, uh, the North pole because otherwise the map would fall down first to put the pin in. Yeah, that's stupid, right? All right. So they speak. Thank you, Sam. Uh, Sam, where are you from? Uh, how do you say your last name there? Uh, Spanish in Peru. Okay. Thank you. That's good to know. In case I ever have to go to Peru. I hope I have to go to Peru sometime. It's almost time to kick up the, kick off the world tour again. Took a break for a while. I was getting kind of tiresome. Yeah. This is what I've been watching forever. This is that persistency thing that I just absolutely love. I mean, I hate to say it, but sometimes in a stock like this, you almost have to just close your eyes and buy it and, and just forget about it. You know, put a stop in place, but it just seems like you're waiting forever for it to set up. I don't want you to rush out and start doing that. But this is one of those stocks I've been watching and watching and watching. And it just goes um, higher and higher and higher. Oh, OK. Sam's uh, Lebanese. Oh, OK. Detroit. OK. Cool. My wife got me into Lebanese food. I absolutely love it. Of course, there's not much food I don't like. <laughs> we had a good uh, salad yesterday. N-V-D-A. And I learned how to say gyro and, uh, a few weeks, a few months back in this um, in this week in charts. Then I went to the restaurant and asked the, the guys to uh, say it for me. Uh, yeah, this is kind of interesting. Uh, it sort of took off, stalled out, and then took off again. And I could tell by my lines in here, uh, I must have said, well, it lost some momentum, but now it's taken off again. So absolutely in a pullback. Uh, on a stock like RII, would you buy at the 20-day EMA um, or 20-day moving average? Not necessarily. Um, you know, this is kind of a rarity. You don't usually see this type of wonderful persistency, especially given this market. Um, I mean, it's not part of my methodology, but it's almost a close your eyes and buy kind of stock. OK, does not fit the methodology because it would have to uh, have a bit of a TKO type of move. But if it does make a TKO move, it might be worth a shot. Um, but it is interesting that it just kind of grinds ahead the way it does. Good look at stock. But yeah, I'm not sure that I would necessarily play uh, pullbacks to the moving averages per se. Uh, for me to, to get excited, I'd, I'd like to see maybe a knockout move to like 16 or something in it. But again, it's like one of those ones, you know, where is it now? Well, th this will probably put the kibosh on it, but it's uh, 1950. So you know, let's see let's see where it is next week and week after and week after on the just buy it trade. Hey, Susan, haven't seen you in a while. Good to see you. ATVI, hey, how have you been? Uh, Activision, this is Activision. And let's back the chart out a little bit. I'm getting a little, getting a strange warning on my PC. Uh, Activision. Um, it didn't really clear the, um, prior highs very decisively in here just yet, but it is, uh, looking kind of interesting. Okay, we got something going on with Chrome. Let's see if we can close those windows down. Um, I'd like to see a little bit more highs before pulling back. I don't know what's the excitement. Is it, uh, this, this has nothing to do with Pokemon Go, does it? MXL, if you haven't covered it. No, we have it. Um. It's just kind of crawling back to its old high, Sam. So I'd like to see it kind of uh, break out decisively to new highs. Let's back the chart out a little bit. Let's see what's happening. Um, it's a little wide and loose, but obviously it's headed higher or has been heading higher. Wait to see if it breaks out to new highs and sticks and then maybe look to play a pullback on that one. Howard wants to know about WPZ. WPZ. Uh, yeah, let's see. This is going to be an oil and gas stock. Does have some resistance up here. That's about a year or so away or back, I should say. Um, it would have to accelerate higher 
for me to get excited and then pull back. And then that would put you right around this resistance. So what I would do is I would tool through the energies and see if there's something else. Oh, you're welcome, Sam. No problem. Glad to have you here. Glad to uh, glad to see a new face in the mix. Um, okay. Did we talk about KLDX? That's Klondike, right? KLDX. Klondex. Uh, yeah, that looks pretty good. Uh, again, like many of the ones we talked about, it's going to have to have a pullback, but absolutely, that needs to be on your momentum list. I do like the way it broke out of a base. That's a pretty cool pattern, as I say quite often. Uh, that first pullback after a base breakout is a good pattern to trade, provided it doesn't come all the way back into the base, especially when you have like a nice uh, trend before it. I don't have it as an official pattern in my books or anything, but you'll see me often talk about it. Sometimes the stock will work its way higher. And then base for a while and then take off and then pull back. That first pullback after the base breakout, provided it doesn't come all the way back to the base. So let me just redraw that. So let's say it takes uh let's say it takes off. Takes off, makes a base, okay. Your base looks like this. And then it breaks out of the base and then pulls back. This is a very tradable pattern, and it's a pattern that I like because the market consolidates here, consolidates its gains, and then it's it's able to take off again and rally. All right, we want to look at FXY. That's going to be some sort of currency ETF. If I guess, it might be the yen. Yes, it is the yen. Um, let's take a look at a hourly chart there, see what's happening. I just want to see if you had a tradable pattern. Well, not really. It's kind of choppy. Well, you probably wouldn't Forex because you wouldn't have these big gaps. So overnight, you probably in Forex, you had some. I'm trying to think if I traded the yen um, to the downside. I, I take a trade and I forget about it uh, pretty quickly. Um, it's worked its way higher. It's pulled back. It looks okay. Um, you know, obviously, it's going to be kind of an, uh, efficient. And it's only has an HV of 15, but that's understandable because it's a non-leveraged type of um, a deal. Uh, let's take a look at like a weekly chart. Nope, two-day maybe. A little bit cleaner when you look at maybe a three-day chart. It does have a little resistance to deal with. I mean, it looks okay. I think there are other things you can do. If you're going to trade the Forex, do it um, – do it through Forex. If you can trade currencies, do it through Forex, and then maybe uh, do it on maybe a shorter term time frame, like an hourly time frame. Meet. I usually don't recommend uh, intraday trading, but in a case like that, I think you might be better off. Uh, yeah, this one looks fantastic. Absolutely. Keep it on your radar. It's been on my radar for quite a while. You need to wait for a, a bit of a, a pullback in here, a bit of a knockout move or something, but absolutely. ASM. Uh, yeah, on a pullback. That's another one of those uh, gold and silver stocks. Uh, kind of volatile, but that's okay. I mean, we like volatility sometimes. Uh, the only thing that scares me a little bit in here is that it's it's had an unbelievably uh, super duper run higher. I mean, that's 300% over a fairly short period of time. So I'd like to see the mother of all knockout moves before getting excited. Oh, you're welcome, Arson. Anytime. WPZ, did we talk about that one? Sounds familiar. Yeah, we talked about that one. RYI. <laughs> Sam's laughing at something. I don't know, I don't know what I said. <laughs> um, yeah, this is one we talked about ex extensively. Okay. All right, we're down to the wire here. Okay, Art says, I'm in RYI. My stop is at 16. Too tight? Um, let's see. What's going on here? Well, um, here's the thing, and this is what I was talking about yesterday in a webinar when I was talking about TKOs. Uh, if the TKO, if you're long a stock and a TKO takes you out, then it might be a bona fide TKO. If you imagine that you're long a stock and if, that, if you know that that TKO would have taken you out, then it's probably a bona fide 
TKO. But um, yeah, you might be a little tight at seven and at sixteen on this stock. Uh, but the persistency has been so amazing in it. But when it corrects, it's going to get uh, it'll correct in a in a fairly ugly fashion, I would think. So um, that's a tough call, Art. But uh, yes or no, probably. Okay, any more? Always glad to tune in, John Dearborn. Oh, you're welcome, John. Glad to have you. Howdy, Dave. I've been busy. Oh, TWLO, IPO. Yeah, that's kind of an interesting one. TWLO. <coughs> Yeah, and this one I was kind of waiting for more of a pullback, but it just hasn't happened yet. Um, I prefer IPOs at least over the last couple of years, as I said in the course, when they come public below 20, uh, at least to take those pioneer signals, the first type of signals. Now, remember earlier I talked about buy a B. That's one of my patterns with IPOs. I should have called it the Landry buy a B, right? Um, where you just pretty much buying a new high. I don't want to give the, the, the rules away for those who have, have the course out of courtesy to them. But uh, in this particular case, obviously so far so good. So I would wait for a pullback. The next pullback absolutely would be worthwhile. So it needs to be on your watch list and it is on my um, watch list too. Howard, I can't read that. Let me get my glasses. If they're not, if you don't, I don't know how to make the font bigger on this. Yeah. I I L G I I L G I I L G ILG and then we'll take it we probably should take a look at ear before we forget um maybe on a pullback um it just doesn't really jump out at me for some reason I guess you have a lot of bad memories it's kind of choppy but it, it, it can trend at times um Maybe if it accelerates higher on a pullback, but right now, obviously, you don't want to jump in midstream. Let's take a look at you first. Ear. Um, the UK shares have bounced back, and they did find a little support towards these lows. Uh, longer term, they still look like they're in a pretty serious downtrend, so I wouldn't rush out and buy the UK just yet. But maybe if we get a serious bow tie, it is multi-year lows. It's not like back in 2009 or, in this case, 2007, too. But maybe if it begins to rally up in bow ties, it might be worth a shot. But it's kind of choppy, and it's been a choppy ride lower in this particular case. Um, as I said, I think after the Brexit deal last few weeks ago, we do have a bow tie coming off of multi-year highs. And so far, this bow tie obviously remains in place. FTV, EWZ is an ETF. E -E -W -Z. Oh, that's Brazil. Okay. Yeah, it looks that's shaping up. Uh, I guess because Brazil has commodities, maybe. That's a weekly. Oh, that was a weekly chart. Take a look at that. Yeah, it looks like a major low to me. Uh, it does have a little uh, resistance here. But, yeah, on the next pullback on the daily chart, it might be worth a shot. And you're probably seeing that because Brazil has a lot of uh, commodities. All right, what do they speak in Brazil? Portuguese? I think they speak Portuguese in Brazil. I might be wrong. I'm showing my ignorance. My wife always corrects me. You can look stupid in front of those people. It's like, well, I don't know everything. Um, well, there's nothing for me here just yet because this is a higher-priced uh, IPO. So it would have to make a pretty serious run higher and then maybe um, on a pullback. Portuguese, hey, I got one right. I'm 50. I'm shooting 50. Okay. ACIA on a pullback, or did it get too wide and loose for Mr. Matt? Hey, Matt, good to, good to see you. ACIA. Uh, no, I don't think it's too wide and loose. I think it's fine. Uh, this is on one of my um, – Watch list. I was watching this uh, retracement recently. It did a first deep retracement, which was a pretty cool pattern. And then, uh, yeah, absolutely. Next pullback. I don't think it's too bad. It's it's an IPO. You know, you got to give it a bit of a a, a pass because it's going to be a little crazy. Yeah, we talked about YRD. I think Sam. Um, or did we? Did I remember? It's going to have to keep breaking out and then on a pullback, Sam. 
Okay, uh, I think we're at our allotted time. Uh, I want to thank everybody for showing up today. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Obviously, I'm humbled and flattered that you are here. Anything unanswered, shoot me an email. <laughs> You're a funny man. <laughs> well, technical analysis is kind of boring. You know, I got to kind of interject a little bit into it. Dave is the man. Thank you, Howard. Uh, anyway, anything unanswered, Dave at DaveLander.com. Everyone enjoy your weekend if we don't talk between now and then. And then I uh, hope to see all you guys and girls again next week. Thank you so much.